four-week series called Disruption is what we've been in. And I asked this question last year, or last week, I said this, don't we love to be disrupted? Anyone? You love disruption in your life? Raise your hand if you absolutely love it. It's something you wish could happen on a daily basis. It's something you're all for. Exactly, if you look around, everyone, no one's raising their hand. It's for a reason, right? But I, I said this, the possibilities of a disruption to take place in your life on a daily basis is huge, right? Whether that's at work, whether that's on your way to, to work, where you're driving there. I'm going to bring up a story about my friend who was on a motorcycle. He didn't expect the day that he's riding to work, he'd get into a car accident. Thankfully, the Lord saved his life, and he's fine. He's here today. No big deal, right? Amen. God, is that good? But we don't expect those things to take place. It's just a normal day, right? You go to work, you drive, you're there at work, whatever it is, and then disruption starts to take place. And my goal through this whole entire series is to take a look at Paul's life. We're going to dive into Paul's past today. And, and the question we need to ask ourselves is, how should I respond? How do I respond to the disruption that takes place on a daily basis? What's my response going to be? I mentioned last week that it's interesting as I was studying for this series called Disruption that my heater and furnace went out, right? And so I'm upset. I'll use, I'll use that word today. I'm very upset about the furnace. I'm very upset about what took place because it causes disruption, right? In the middle of winter, you don't have a heater. That definitely is a, is a problem. And so I told you guys, honestly, that my response to that disruption was horrible. Everyone remember that? I was being honest, right? And we held up our own situations that took place. We were like, this is the disruption that took place in my life. This is how I responded. I hope you have the same paper today or you're taking notes today because we're going to keep writing things down. And the, the point is, I believe that every disruption leads to an opportunity. For me, the opportunity was for God to show me my heart in the matter, that I was so mad and upset for this furnace and not thankful that I have a house to actually live in, that I have kids, that I have, uh, my kids have sweaters and blankets and everything they need to keep warm in case these things happen, right? I saw the opportunity in it to be thankful, not upset and angry at God because of what happened and that my furnace is now, you know, dead and I had to pay all this money to get it fixed, whatever. It's not of that. It's, it's looking at the opportunity in the midst of the disruption. And so last week, again, we wrote that down. We held it up. We said, look, there's opportunity in this. You guys remember that? I had you hold it up and I said, there's opportunity in this. Whatever that disruption is, there's opportunity in it. And so it's important, our outlook on it, that we're focusing on the opportunity in the midst of the disruption. We looked at what that disruption does to us, right? It can lead us away from God when things take place in our life because we cast blame on him for it taking place. Anytime, I, I'm sure if you want to be honest this morning, you would say, yes, at one point there was something that took place in my life. And I said, God, why did you do this? Right, we're casting blame on him, saying, why God did you do this? And so there's two ways we respond. We say, why God, which leads us away, because we cast blame, and therefore we become bitter and angry towards God because of the situations taking place in our life. Anyone say amen? amen. Yes, there we go, it's true. And then the opposite side of that, is that we would lean towards God because in the midst of that disruption, it shows us how much we need him, how much we need to cling to him, how much more we need to understand him, right? And those are great opportunities. I mentioned these, these, these things. If you weren't here last week, I would recommend writing these things down. I said this, you're never more teachable than in the midst of a disruption. You're never more teachable than in the midst of a disruption. Why? Because you're vulnerable. Who loves to be vulnerable? Exactly. Go ahead, look around. <coughs> Nobody. Right? It's a tough place to be. But the point is, when you're in the midst of that disruption, you are now teachable because you're vulnerable. Your heart is open to receiving. Because you're basically running around frantic going, Lord, what do I do in this mess? What do I do in this situation? Help me. Right? And so we're vulnerable. We're teachable. And then I mentioned these three things. I said, God never wants you to stop growing. He never wants you to stop growing. And then number two, you grow most in the midst of a hardship and or change, which we all know that, right? We hate change at times, but we know it grows us. We know we actually need it because we get complacent in our little circle. We get complacent in what we're used to and content. And that disruption is for a reason to show you, hey, there's something greater. There's something bigger. I want to get your attention. Can you listen to me? And then we open up and we go, okay, I see what you want to do here. And it's an opportunity for us to grow. And number three, I mentioned this. Your growth depends on your ability to embrace the disruption. 
So again, as, as we look at these things, the goal is I want us to understand how to embrace those things, how to embrace that chaos, that disruption that takes place. And this week, we're going to jump into Paul's past. And I want us to think about our past. Because somewhere along the line, or somewhere along the way in your life, a disruption took place that radically changed your life. Radically. Whether that was giving your life over to Jesus, that's a radical change. Anyone? That is a radical change that takes place. And so, if maybe that was it for you. But somewhere along the way, a disruption took place that radically changed you. Or maybe you've never actually experienced something like that. You've never experienced radical change. You're, or maybe you're just so set in your ways that you won't even move because you think where you're at is exactly where you're supposed to be. And you're like, no, I don't want to move away from this because I'm happy here. Or I'm content right here. And I don't like the change. I don't like the disruption. So I'll stay right here. Paul thought he was exactly where he needed to be, but that he was doing all the right things and that nothing could get better. And let me tell you this, this is us a lot of the time. We're content. We're happy where we are. We, we don't want the disruption to take place. We get caught up in the traditional ways of our thinking because, hey, I've been a Christian for 20 years. I know how this thing goes. I've been a Christian for 30 years. I know how this thing goes. I've been a Christian for five years. I know how this thing goes, right? You get complacent because your thinking is, well, I already know what this says. And this never changes. Thank the Lord for that, amen? But the point is, are we actually teachable? Are we actually teachable? And I want you to ask yourself this question today. How teachable am I? How teachable are you? Are you receptive to receive teaching? Are you receptive to, to receive something that may look different than your thinking? Or something that may look completely different that you're like, man, I, I thought I read it this way, but it actually means this. Are you teachable and are you willing to accept the disruption in exchange for change? Are you willing to accept it? That's hard to hear. Are you willing to accept that disruption in exchange for change? Because at times we desperately need it. So as we jump into Paul's past, before we jump into our text, I want to read this to you. And it's in Galatians 1, starting in verse 13. Paul's talking about his past. He says this. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish, Jewish religion. How I violently persecuted God's church. He's speaking of his past. He, he's like, look, I was a Jew. I was, I was in that religion. I was a part of what they were doing. And I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. Listen to his words. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. So he's saying something very specific. I was a Jew. I was a part of the traditional religion that took place in that time frame. And I actually was against what we'll hear as the way. They bring it up as the way. And if you read that, it means Christians. They probably got that from Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Right? And so as these Christians were coming, giving their life over to Jesus, following Jesus, they were like, they're called the way. And so he persecuted them. Persecuted them. But here's what's interesting. He thought he had it all right. And he thought he had it all together. Focus on religious things. Focus on what he was taught and told. And in fact, he was actually persecuting God's church and doing the opposite of what he thought he was supposed to do. So again, he's telling us these things in Galatians, but Paul brings up his past. And I want to ask this, why is it important to view Paul's past? Because Paul thought, he, again, he had it all together. He knew exactly what God wanted. And then disruption takes place in his life. And he realizes it has nothing to do with him and has everything to do with Jesus. And for us, even today that know the truth, this can be us at times. Well, we're stuck in our own ways and we're saying it's all about me when in fact it's all about Jesus. Amen? Amen? And so as we look at this, turn with me to Acts chapter 22 and we're going to dive in really quickly. Give you some uh, context here. There's a mob that's taking place. Paul is out and about. He's doing his thing. He's preaching the gospel. He's, he's saying something completely different than what they're used to and what they know him for. And so they're getting very, very upset at him. Rightfully so in their mind, right? And so we're going to jump in. And we're going to see what he's talking about here. As this mob, he's turning to the mob that's saying, basically, get rid of him. He turns to the mob and he addresses them. And this is what he says, starting in, uh, we'll say, verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now, as he's addressing. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silence. And then he said this. 
I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you are all today. I love that he says that. He's, he's mentioning, hey, I know you guys are thinking you're all zealous for God. I was the same exact way. Verse 4, I persecuted this way. Again, saying the way. He's talking about Christians. To death, binding and delivering them into prisons, both men and women. As also the high priest bears witness in all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. He's saying, look, even from the council, the Jewish re religion, the, the, the guys that were over these things, they gave me letters to go get more Christians, bound them up, and bring them back so they can be punished. And then he's going to go into something very, very specific. Let's read it through. Now what happened? As I journeyed and came near Damascus, he's talking about his road on the way to do what he just said he was going to do. At about noon, that suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So the very, very beginning here as he's talking, he's saying, look, in verse 3, I'm a Jew. That's who I am. I am a Jew. He's saying that he is one of them. So first of all, he's saying, look, I'm one of you. And he's saying, look, I believe the same things. I was a part of the same exact culture you are part of now. And I love that he addresses it this way because of what he's going to talk about next. But the important thing is he's saying, look, we're the same here. I grew up in the same exact area. I'm the same exact Jew as you are. And I believe the same things culturally brought up in the same thing. I'm a native. I'm brought up in this city. Basically, I am one of you. And so out of the gate, as he addresses this, it's very important because guess what? They're now paying attention and they're now listening because they're going, okay, he's speaking our language. He is one of us. I don't know what's going on here because he's preaching a different gospel. And so now they're upset, right? What's taking place? Why is this happening? We know who this guy is because he's telling him, look, I was trained by who? By Gamaliel. And this is what's so important. One of the most reputable rabbis in that time frame. Trained by one of the most reputable rabbis in that time frame. That's big because he's saying, look, I'm not just, just a Jew. I'm not just born here. I'm not just a part of your culture. I was trained by the guy that you look most up to. And he said, I was zealous for those things. I was trained by the man that you look at. In Acts 5.34, we see how important this man is. It says, but one member... As, a, as he's speaking to, to the apostles, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people. So listen to that. He was an expert in religious law. So he knew the Jewish law. He knew all about it. He was the most reputable rabbi. And then it goes on to say, respected by all people. All people doesn't mean one person. All people means all people. So you see how respected this man is. Is it saying he's respected by all people? He stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. So when he, in that moment, what's taking place is the apostles are basically in this room kind of on trial. He says, look, we want to get rid of these guys because they're, they're preaching a false gospel in their mind, right? Let's get rid of them. And everyone agreed with him because of who he was. He was well respected and he was an expert in their religious law. So it's important that he brings this up. He says, look, I was trained by this guy. I am a Jew. I'm brought up in the city. I'm one of you. And Paul tells us that he was trained by the best, again, in their religious circle, the follower of, of the law. He's saying, look, I was a follower of the same exact law that you were all following. That was me. He was zealous toward God and persecuted the ones that they wanted him to. He did whatever they asked him to do. When we dive deep into those things and we talk about it, he did whatever the religious culture was telling him to do. Because guess what? He had so much passion for the religious law. Passion. And he did whatever it took to make it happen. That even took killing other people that were against him. That even, that even meant him grabbing people, putting shekels on them, bringing them to jail, persecuting them, being a part of Stephen's stoning, being a part of other stonings, being a part of the great persecution that took place when Christians were radically scattered all over the place because they were being persecuted. Being a part of these things. And as he's saying this again, he's saying, look, I was zealous just like you are. And in verse 4, he says, basically, that in the Jews' eyes, he was everything that they wanted to be. Everything they wanted to be. 
If there's anyone we can be, it's the ones, again, in their mind that are above us, right? The ones that are the experts, the ones that are being trained by the experts. Those are the ones we want to be. But here's what he did. He made a name for himself, not God. And even today, this takes place in Christian culture. And even today, this takes place in pulpits. And even today, this takes place across the whole entire world as people are focusing on themselves, claiming to preach the gospel when it's all about them. And so what I'm saying is, let's cause massive disruption to get out of that thinking and remove ourselves and put Jesus rightfully in the place that he's supposed to be, on the throne. And so again, as Paul's expressing himself and saying these things, he's like, I made a name for myself. But why does he bring all this up? I believe he brings it up not only to show who he once was and what God did in his life, which is huge, but to show humility and to show how teachable you can be even when, listen to this, how teachable you can be even when you quote unquote know it all. We all have to be willing to be teachable. We all have to be willing to receive what God has for us, even when we think we know everything. What happens is we can fall into the same exact trap that these men were in, the same exact trap that they're a part of, the things that they're thinking, their mindset, what they think is religious and what they think is absolutely right. And in verse four, again, as he says, I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Look, look how he expresses that. He says, look, I did these things. Because here's what's so important is, Paul's being so honest right now. He's telling him exactly the things that he did. And for some odd reason, many of us in this room won't say the things that we've done in the past because we think that, that that for some odd reason affects our future in Christ. And it doesn't. When he saved you, he saved you from those sins. When he saved you, he said, I save you for all sins. I'm giving you all the grace. I'm not giving you a portion of the grace or a portion of forgiveness. I'm giving you all forgiveness. And guess what, Christian? You should be doing the same for all the brothers and sisters around you, even the ones that are standing in the back stabbing you or saying negative things about you. Because Jesus did that for us. Yeah. Though we sinned against him. He died for our sins. Even in the midst of us sinning, he died for us. And it's so insane to me as we live in this digital culture where all of these articles come out about this artist and this artist. And this artist was a Christian. And now they're saying they're not a Christian artist anymore, but they're still a Christian. And all of a sudden, all these Christians come out and start bashing on people. Why? Why? Because they're trying to preach the gospel in a different way? G Jesus says, go on the byways. Go, go everywhere and preach the gospel. He doesn't say come into a church and do it. He says outside the church. Here's to be equipped. Here's to dive deep so we can understand it, so we can go teach the gospel, go spread the gospel, more importantly, spread hope to those who desperately need it. But the problem is we can fall into the same trap Paul was even in, knowing the truth about Jesus, it, even us knowing the truth about Jesus, that we can fall into that same trap. We become the same Pharisees, the same rabbis that these men were, saying that we know what God wants, we know what he desires of us, but we have completely fallen into, I'm gonna give you this idea called robotic theology. And here's the idea as I started thinking through it that we can know everything in this book and not know it at all. Do you hear me, church? We can know everything about this book but not know it at all. It's, it's being robotic. It's just saying, look, I read the whole entire thing. I get it. I understand what happens from front to finish. I get everything in it. I understand the theology, but it's robotic. It's saying, look, I understand. I, I see everything. I have read it all, but you cannot know it at all. Head knowledge can be fantastic, but it'll never change you. Yeah. Ever. Ever. We can try so hard. We can know every single verse in the Bible and know it by heart. But, it, it, but if it's all here, it's going to do nothing in your life. It needs to go here. It needs to be in the heart. And that's what Paul's life was all about. It was all about that. As he's reading the first five books of the Bible, he probably knew it by heart. By heart, guys. By heart, every single verse. And yet he didn't know anything that it was saying. Because it was all here. All here. 
And it di he didn't allow it to teach his actual heart and change him. So what I'm saying is how teachable are you? How teachable are you? Because the disruption is what we need. The disruption takes place so we can be in that vulnerable state to, to hear from God and be teachable. Because again, as I was saying earlier, we may know this front to back and we may see it uh, again always uh, reading it over and over and over again and go, yeah, I get it. I understand it. But at the same time, it's not, we're not allowing it to actually affect our heart and change us because we're stuck in the same mentality over and over again. This is the way it's always been. So it must just always be this way. This is the way it should be. So it has to be this way. Is it really? Is it really? Because even those who culturally, again, as we read this, culturally religious, I said this last week, the number one person that disrupted the whole entire world, his name was Jesus. He came in and caused massive disruption. He came in and did the opposite of what everyone was doing or thought they were right in doing it. He came in and showed the way. He said, look, you don't just forgive people. You forgive them 70 times 7 times 7. I mean, they were mind blown, right? They're going, what does that even mean? He's saying, always. There's not a number I can even give you. He's saying, you consistently and constantly forgive. And they're mind blown. But what do you, what do you mean, right? He comes in, he's like, no, 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 no. I died for everyone, not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles. And I don't want us to get caught up in the same mentality as the religious culture. Thinking because it's been this way or that way or this way. I'm saying allow the Holy Spirit to move. Allow the Holy Spirit to move. God doesn't change. We're not saying this is ever going to change. It will never change because he never does. But what I'm saying is as culture ships, we can bring the gospel in a new way. We can teach it differently to the culture that's here. We can, we can go outside these walls again, right? And, and, and into the valley and preach the gospel in places that maybe you're not used to going. Maybe it's a coffee shop. Maybe it's at your work. Maybe it's on your drive. Wherever it is, I'm saying, let's go out and let's do some radical things for the gospel and stop being complacent in where we are. Because it's time for that. And again, I don't want us to fall into that trap because the temptation is to say, I already know. I already have gone through this. I already blah, 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 or blah, 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 or blah, 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 right? And instead, allowing God to show us in our hearts, what ways can I grow, Lord? Can you show me the areas that I need to be taught in? How can I be more teachable? We need to be teachable because we're never more teachable than in the midst of a disruption. The whole reason, again, of this series is that we're saying, you know what, Lord, we're going to take the disruptions. We're going to take those hits and we're going to allow ourselves to be taught in the midst of them. We need to be disrupted in many ways because we need to grow. As I mentioned earlier, being a Christian for 40 years or 20 years or five years, whatever it is, you can learn something new every single day about God. Every day. And again, as you read this over and over and over again, we should be asking and praying and asking the Lord, Lord, show me. Isn't it so interesting as you read a passage, then you go back maybe 10 years or, or even a week and you go back to it and how you see new things in it and God speaks in different ways in it. That's the Holy Spirit moving. So what I'm saying is don't get tempted in the past ways of, oh, I've already read it. I already know what it says. Start reading it again and allow your heart to be teachable. Allow your heart to receive something new. Allow the Lord to speak in different ways. Because as we do that, we're going to grow in massive ways. We're going to grow. And that's when we're allowing the Holy Spirit to do that and we're allowing God to move. I'm telling you, that's when radical things take place, like the Jesus movement. That's when radical things take place in a valley that desperately needs Jesus is when we're willing to be teachable. We're willing to go outside these walls and preach the gospel. But not just preach it and stand here like I am yelling at people. It's a different thing. You can actually live it. And people will see how you live and they'll ask, how are you that way? Or why is it that you have so much passion and joy in your life? I want that. Amen. That's how we should be. Amen? Amen? Where people look at us differently and they say, there is something different about you. I live in a religious culture and I'm saying, I don't have any of that. And I want that hope. And that's us. We have that. And so for us, is we should be running outside these walls, desperately grabbing people in and bringing them in. In Matthew, Jesus is going around. He's healing people in the synagogues. He's healing people all around. And, and people are starting to hear about it. I was speaking to the team a couple weeks ago about this because I love this passage. As Jesus is healing people, then this is what took place. As Jesus is healing people, the word started to spread. 
The word started to spread that Jesus is over there healing people. And guess what they did? They brought everyone that was sick to guess who? Jesus. Why? Because he's the healer. He's the one that has hope. So what I'm saying and what I was saying to the team was, let's do this, guys. We know where hope is. We know where healing is. Bring those people here. Bring them in and tell them there is a place where you can find hope. There is a place where you can find healing. And as I mentioned those things, I mentioned the same statistics that maybe I talked about last week of suicide being the second leading cause of death here in the state of Utah. Are you kidding? We should be showing hope and love to these people. Despite everything they're going through, we may not disagree. I understand that. I'm not saying agree with them. I'm saying love on them and show them where hope is found. I'm saying love on them and show them where healing is. I'm saying tell them you don't need those prescription drug medication. You need Jesus. He has the hope and healing that you have been looking for every single day. Amen. And in Matthew, as they bring all of these sick people towards Jesus, guess what he does? He heals them. It's possible. It is so possible. But the question is, how teachable are you? Are you willing to accept that disruption? Are you willing to go, you know what, Lord? You can do these things. You can change a valley. You can change a state. You can change a world. You can change a country. It's possible. But it's going to take us believing and having faith that it is and stepping out of our comfort zones, allowing the disruption to take place because to see the opportunity that lies in the midst of disruption. We don't want to get stuck in that robotic theology of thinking, I know this, I know this, I know this, I know this, because that's the way you've always been taught it. Allow the Lord to disrupt your heart so you can continue to grow. Allow him to disrupt it. In verse 6, again, as he's talking about what happened and what took place after that, it says this, Now it happened. As I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Again, I bet Paul's mind in that moment is, is the mind-blown emoji, right, that takes place. He's thinking, are you serious? I thought I was doing all these things. I thought I was checking all these boxes. I was doing the prayers that I'm supposed to. I was reading. I know the, these books in the Bible. I know X. I know Y. I know Y. I know Y. And all of a sudden he's saying, wait, but Jesus is saying I'm persecuting him. And I know it's hard to hear, but this is us at times where we get caught up in this idea of, yeah, it's a relationship, but really in your mind, it's just a religion. I gotta go here, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. I'm saying, if you're saying I got to, you need to recheck your heart. You should be saying I want to because of what Jesus has done for me. That should be a heart in this. But again, are you teachable? Are you willing to receive that? Are you willing to hear, hey, David, wake up. You've been doing these things all for the wrong reasons. You've been doing these things to check this or do that or do this. You've been reading every day just to say this. You've been reading just so you can post something on Facebook and say that I read. Anyone? I'm just kidding. It's good. It's good. I love it. Keep posting Bible verses. It's a way that we can get the gospel out. I'm for it. But the idea is who are you doing it for? Yourself or for him? And so we need to check our heart in those ways and allow again the Lord to disrupt our heart so we can continue to grow. Paul thought once again that as he was on his way to do what's right, on his way to do what's right because he was told to do it, he was like, I'm against the way, against the Christians. They're teaching a false gospel. I'm on my way to do what's right. He responds with this, who are you, Lord? Again, can you imagine what's going on in his mind? I thought I knew it all. I thought X, I thought Y, but God had some things he needed to teach Paul. He needed to show Paul and he needed to grow Paul. And again, the question is, how teachable are you? How teachable are you? are you? Are you humble enough to receive what God wants to say? Are you humble enough to receive what God wants to do? Are you willing to see the opportunities in the disruption? Because there's growth there. There's growth right in the midst of it. I'm going to have Josiah come out. I'm going to come down here because as I started thinking through this and started thinking about just the idea of 
of what's taking place. As Paul's speaking again, look, he's saying, this is who I was. This is the religion I was a part of. I thought I had it all together. I thought I knew what it all meant. You know, and, and again, as Jesus shows up, he's saying, no, you had it all wrong. I don't want us to get in that same mentality where it looks like this, where this is our life. This is our Christian life, right? It's, don't ask me to hula hoop. That's going to be really bad. Uh, I'm really bad at that. Um, but, but this is us. Anyone with me? This is us, right? We see this. This is us. We walk around. This is our Christian life. We're like, yes, I'm good. I'm content. That This is the way it's always been. I, I like it this way. It's comfortable. You know, I don't really want to grow. I, I like being here. This is, how I, this is how much I understand the Bible. I don't really want to know more of it because I feel like X, I read this and I'm like confused or whatever it is, but we're stuck in this mentality and all of a sudden disruption takes place, right? And it starts to rock the boat. Rock the boat. Rock the boat. Disruption takes place and we're like, I don't want the disruption in my life. So stay away from me. So we see the disruption coming and what do we do? We run the opposite direction. Anyone with me? We run the opposite direction when that disruption takes place. But all in all, what God's trying to do is he's trying to show you, hey, I'm just trying to grow you. I need you to receive the disruption because there's opportunity there. Because guess what? You're stuck in this. You can move around all you want. You can keep moving and you can keep moving. But guess what? You're stuck in this. And he's saying, allow the disruption to take place because there's opportunity. There's opportunity that you may not see, but it is there. I'm trying to grow you. I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to show you you need a deeper relationship with me. Stop thinking X. Stop, stop thinking that this person says this. And because they said this, they're not a Christian. Or just because they did this, they're not a Christian. David, when you look at King David, what are the two things he's known for? David and Goliath and David and Bathsheba. What does the Bible say about David? He cheated on somebody with their wife. And then what do you do? He killed the man. But guess what the Bible says? He had a heart after God's own heart. Hear that loud and clear. Why would the Bible say that? God forgave him. He loves him. No matter what. And so we get stuck in this mentality when all the time as those disruptions are taking place and when the disruption is happening, God's doing exactly what Josiah did. And all he's saying is, look, I have something bigger and better for you. Do you not see the growth that I have for you? If you can see the lines and the rope, that's the idea. He's saying, look, it's not just inside of this. Allow the disruption to take place so you can grow. And now you can see things differently. And now I'm able to teach you because you can move more. You can see more. You can grow in different areas that you maybe have not grown in before. You can read different things in the Bible and understand it differently and grow from it. You can have relationships with people. Maybe you thought you'd never have a relationship with them. But you're the only Jesus that they can see. And so he expands those borders and he says, allow it to take place because there's opportunity here. There's opportunity in the midst of this. And I know it's difficult and I know it's hard, but see what I see. There's a future in this. There's opportunity that rests here. There's ways that I wanna grow you in incredible ways. You go, Lord, I don't think I could do this. I'm not meant to do this. I'm not meant to serve. I'm not meant to, to be on a Greek team or serve in the children's ministry. Whatever it is that you think in your mind, I can't do this. I'm telling you, I believe that's the enemy speaking to you, telling you you can't because God says you can. You can. There's opportunity there. And so for us, I want us to get out of that mindset where we're stuck in the hula hoop. We're stuck in it. That we remove it and we see all that God has for us. And that it is so I wish I could open up the whole entire thing here and show you how much God has for you. But we have to be willing to be teachable. We have to be willing to receive the disruption and go, okay, Lord, help me see the opportunities that are in this. Tragedy strikes every single day and it is hard to go through. And for us as Christians, when tragedy hits, what we should be doing is praying this God, Shine your light in the midst of the tragedy. Shine your light. How can we show who and how great you are in the midst of this? It's us seeing the opportunity in it. It's us seeing that God has something greater and bigger. Thank you, Josiah. It's us being willing again to be teachable. We're all willing to see and be a part of radical change around us. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. 
that we want to see radical change take place, that we want to see change take place around us, in our countries, in our states, all those things. But are you willing to see radical change in your own life? It's easy to go, I want to see these things happen. I want God to move. I, I, I want to see, you know, mass amount of people's lives changed. But are you willing to see your life radically change? Are you willing to receive all that God has for you, even when you think you know it all? Even with that mindset, Paul did. He knew the scriptures. He could probably teach them without even looking at them. Yet his heart was so hard and it was so wrong. But full humility took over and he was teachable. Jesus showed up. And, and next week we're going to dive in deeper into this text and see what actually took place and what took place after. As Paul is being teachable saying, you know what? Okay, Lord, show me what to do then something radical took place. I want us to be that. I want our hearts to be that. I want us to go, you know what, Lord, maybe we thought we knew you, or maybe we thought we knew X or we knew Y, but in all reality, we didn't know anything because we're focused on ourselves and what we want to do, not what God wants to do here. So let's be teachable. You're never more teachable than in the midst of any structure. Let me give you one last one. Because as we think about these things, we may be thinking right now, I'm worried, I'm stressed, I'm maybe discouraged, I'm scared of the destruction. I'm scared of what's ahead in 2019. In Psalm 18:2, it says this, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. So if you're willing, again, in the midst of destruction for the Lord to teach you, understand this, He's your Savior. And He's saying, I am your rock. And this is where you find protection. If you need it, just run to me because it's the power that has saved you. My place is of safety. There's no reason to be scared. There's no reason to be stressed and the disruption ahead. There's no reason to, to have the temptation to run away from those things. Run towards it and allow God to be your safety. Allow God to be your rock. Allow God to be your fortress. He's saying, I am those things. Don't be afraid of it. Just run towards me. Before we end with a, a quick song, I just want to ask this. Maybe that's you this morning where you've been stuck in this, this mentality. You've been stuck in this thinking. You've been stuck. You're like, you know what, Lord? I want those disruptions. I want those opportunities. I, I, I want to see uh, how you can change my heart and how you can change me. Lord, I'm willing and I'm able. If that is you, what I'm going to ask is just come forward. I just want to pray with you. Because a lot of times it's so hard to do this on our, by ourselves. And so I'm saying, church, if that is you, well, you, you're, you want it. You want to see growth in 2019. You want to see those disruptions. You want to see those opportunities in them. I'm saying, let's pray together. Let's pray together. Because we are a family. And so those that want to come up and want to pray, those sitting down that want to stay, just pray for those people. Because we shouldn't be afraid of it. And as Clay plays this in one second, as he's playing this, just pray. Ask the Lord. If this is what you want, just come forward. Just come forward. We're going to pray together as a team. We're going to pray together as a family. And just ask the Lord to reveal those opportunities. Ask the Lord to grow us. Ask the Lord to show us in the ways that we need to be teachable. Ask the Lord to open up our heart to see the negative, to see the sin and to go, I need change here, Lord. I need change here. Disrupt it. Disrupt it so I can be teachable. As, as Clay sings this, just go ahead and come forward and we'll pray together. stars who call and each my name I'll surely keep your promise to me that I will rise in your victory and you who the stars
says those words says it says that I will rise in your victory he's already won there's nothing to be afraid of he's saying there's victory in me just come to me that's it there's victory here so there's nothing to be afraid of we should want to see that growth in our life we should want to see the potential that we have because God's saying don't get complacent don't stay there there's bigger things ahead there's a future ahead and sometimes we think just because of some sin in our life that we can't grow or some of these things that take place in our past that we can't see a future God says I died for all of those things there is a future there is something for you radical things don't get stuck there because that's the enemy saying that you can he's saying you can I'm your fortress I am for you and if I'm for you no one can be against you why he's God and he's bigger than anything you can imagine if there's anyone else just come because we're singing this out say he is our victory Father, I want to see the opportunity in the midst of disruption this year. I want to be more teachable. I don't want to get stuck and complacent in my thinking and the way that I've always done things, Lord. And I'm asking right now, Lord, that you would cause those massive disruptions, as hard as they are, that they would see the opportunity in them, Lord, as they're saying, I want that, Father, that this year would be a year of massive growth, and not just growth, but a year where they can see just the ways that you've gifted them, Lord, the ways that they can preach the gospel to friends, family, those around them, Lord, the ways that they can change a valley and a culture that desperately needs you, Lord. That, Father, you'd show them the mighty power that lives inside of them, that Holy Spirit that has taken over, Lord, that they're willing to hand it all over to you and say, I want to be teachable. Show me how to be teachable. Show me the sins in my life. Show me the areas I need to grow in. And grow me, Lord. No matter how hard it is, Lord, they're saying they're willing. So, Father, bring it. And for those that are scared this morning and saying, I'm just not sure about this, Lord. Again, remind them that you are their rock, their fortress. You are every single thing that they need. You are their Savior. You died for their sins, Lord. If you died for our sins, that shows us how much you love us. That shows us how much you care for us. And that also shows us that you will never leave us or forsake us, Lord. Let us understand that and let us know it. But this morning, radical change will take place in our hearts. That we're just not up here just to be up here. But we're up here to say, Lord, I really want it. I really desire it. And I want to seek change. And I want to understand you more and more and more. And I want you to speak in new ways, Lord. So, Father, be with all of these men and women that are standing. You do radical things in their life. And that together, as a family, all of us here standing and all of us here sitting, would see that you are doing radical things. And that, Father, we jump all in, ready to do it with you, Lord. That we jump all in, not scared of what people are going to think, not scared of what people are going to do, but just focus on you and realizing that those people that may be against us, Lord, it's because they're hurting, it's because they're broken, and it's because they absolutely need hope. 